tales for dark nights. <laughs> come one, come all to our matinee of madness, and partake in this theater of the mind. Welcome to the Simply Scary Podcast, Season 1, Episode 10. I'm your Master of Ceremonies, G.M. Danielson. tirelessly trying efforts to bring you brand new fear, the Simply Scary Podcast sometimes devotes our episodes to the works of single authors that are haunted by dark, foreboding visions. The only way to purge them from their minds? Why, by trying to pass them on to you, of course. For this excursion, we take wicked pleasure in bringing you the works of a sword-fighting enthusiast from New York whose writing talents will leave your blade trembling. The author of this episode's dread is named James Colton, and the stories we present to you will come from his stellar short story collection, Pages of Dust. We'll begin the first frightening adventure right after this important message. Hello listeners, Jesse Cornett here with an important word about today's stories. James Colton's Pages of Dust is not just one book with killer stories, it's a whole series of books. You can find them all, Pages of Dust Volumes 1, 2, and 3, on Amazon.com. And right now, through November 25th, you have a chance to get the Kindle edition of Pages of Dust Volume 1 for free. That's right, folks. He said free. So go to Amazon.com after the show and search for James Colton's Pages of Dust to get Volume 1 for free now through November 25th. Back to our show. Welcome back, listener. Now it is time to bring you our opening act from James Colton's Pages of Dust. The first dusty pages we'll be reading are those from the journal of a man who has moved into a new apartment. Everything about this place, from the reclusive neighbors to the design of his rooms, is very odd indeed. As he begins to smell strange smells and hear disturbing silences, he will reach a point where he will be begging for the situation to be merely very odd. C.C. Childers brings to life James Colton's Unit 319. Day one in the new apartment. Got the furniture arranged how I wanted. Started unpacking my clothes. Haven't met any of the neighbors yet, but they're probably all at work. My unit's very long and narrow. When you first come in, there is a kitchen and a living room squished together. A hallway stretches out the back, and that's where the longness comes from. It's only a couple feet wide, with doors leading to the bathroom, linen closet, and bedroom lining the left side. The right has windows every few feet overlooking the courtyard at the center of the building two stories below. Not a pretty view. It's all concrete, and the few trees they tried planting look sick. It's a weird layout, but hey, can't beat 400 a month for rent. Well, best get to unpacking. I really wish there were more windows. Got almost everything unpacked today. All that's left are my clothes. 
I'm holding off on hanging them in the closet because there's a bad smell inside. Trying to air it out first. Maybe I should stick an air freshener in there. Almost saw one of my neighbors this afternoon. I was coming out of the bedroom and caught a flash of light from the corner of my eye. I looked out the window into the courtyard just in time to see a glass door swing shut. Should probably get some sleep now. I really wish there was a window in the bedroom. Even on the third floor, I feel like I'm underground. I think I overheard an argument last night. First sign of anyone else living here I've had since moving in. Well, aside from the courtyard door yesterday. Didn't sleep well because of the noise. It was muted by the walls, but it sounded like a bad fight. Lots of screaming and crying. The closet still smells. I think I'll get an air freshener tomorrow on my way back from work. Oh, and I should see if I can get the landlord to fix the hot water. I don't think I can stand another ice shower, especially this time of year. Speaking of which, we're supposed to get snow tonight. Yep, we definitely got snow. Work was closed today, and I can't see much out the windows in the hallway. I know there's someone living above me. I've been hearing them walk around all day. I wonder if they're new, since this is the first I've heard of them. Been hearing other signs of life, too. A door slammed downstairs a few minutes ago, and someone walked by my unit talking to someone else. I guess with the bad weather, everyone's cooped up inside. Snowstorm cleared up last night. Picked up an air freshener on the way home from work, set it up in the closet, which, by the way, smells worse than ever. I also went ahead and put my coat hangers in there. Still holding off on the clothes themselves, though. The apartment looks a lot nicer in the snow. The cars are just humps of white in an otherwise smooth blanket. The concrete is all covered up. Even the sickly trees look magical with icicles hanging off their branches. Less pleasant, however, are the neighbors. I still haven't actually seen anyone, but I can hear them. Someone's yelling right now, in fact. Sounds really angry. Now there's someone banging. I don't like this. I can't sleep. The shouter quit around 11, but I can't relax. I think... I think every time I start to drift off, something wakes me up. Like that kind of noise that's very quiet, but just the right wavelength to get stuck in the back of my head like a worm. Finally got some sleep last night, but I'm not sure it was enough. It's weird, I don't know. When I come home from work, I notice the only tire tracks coming out of the parking lot were mine from earlier. Does nobody else here work? I guess they could have just used the trail I blazed this morning. As I was getting ready for bed, I thought I saw the courtyard door open again. I looked out but saw nothing. Too much nothing, actually. Something wasn't right, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I haven't been able to get in touch with the landlord, so I still don't have any hot water. I may just stop taking showers. Alright. I know I'm not hearing things. It's 2.30 in the morning, but this has been going on all night. There's a rattling sound coming from the closet. I should go see what it is. But I don't want to for some reason. I checked on the closet this morning. Turns out if I tap one of the coat hangers, they all bump into each other and make the exact same noise I heard last night. Can't think of what might have done it, though. Maybe there's a draft. And while I'm talking about the closet, the air freshener isn't working. It's just mixing with the stink and making it worse. More weird stuff. Ever since the snowstorm, I've had this wrong feeling. And I finally pinned it down. The cars. They're all buried, and no one's dug them out. I'm the only one that comes and goes. Mine are the only tire tracks in the parking lot. But there's more. I realized it while I was staring at the courtyard this evening. No footprints. That rattling sound started up again. I don't think I'll get any sleep tonight. Oh, I think these late night entries are going to become a regular thing. I heard someone screaming. It was far away, but it drove me nuts, and I started pacing my unit trying to figure out which direction it was coming from. 
I eventually settled at one of the windows. The voice seemed to be coming from the other side of the courtyard. She must have been screaming really loudly for me to hear it all the way over here. I'm writing this in the living room. I don't want to go back to my bedroom. The rattling noise is going on right now. I tested my draft theory, but couldn't pick up the faintest breeze. Besides, even a draft couldn't rattle the coat hangers that hard. I think one of them just fell off the rack. I didn't go to work today. I'm too tired. Couldn't sleep. Still no footprints in the courtyard. Cars in the parking lot still buried. All my coat hangers were on the floor. I just want to get out of here. I just want to get out. I've got enough money to stay at a hotel until I find a new place. I just peeked into the hallway. One of the coat hangers is there. Why is it there? It should be in the bedroom. Calm down. Just... Get your keys and get out of here for a little bit. But my keys are in the bedroom. I don't want to go in there. All right. I got my keys and I'm leaving now. Coat hangers scattered everywhere. Also, as I left the bedroom, I was staring straight out the window, right at the courtyard door. It opened. It shut. There was no one there. I'm still in my unit. I've got the keys in my hand, but now there is a shadow under the door. It appeared just when I was about to leave, and it's been there ever since. This is the closest I've come to actually seeing someone in this building. Maybe it's the landlord. Maybe they finally sent someone to take care of the hot water. Don't be stupid, they would have knocked by now. I could check. Look out the people. I don't wanna. I don't want to. Every time I go to look at something, there's no one there. What if I look out and there's no one there again? Why is that shadow there? There was a noise behind me just now. I look back and there's a coat hanger in the living room. It's one of the metal ones, and it's all bent out of shape. My eye keeps being drawn to the hook. It's dark now. I still haven't looked out the peephole. Can't make myself do it. I'm sitting with my back up against the door, and I swear I can feel something leaning against the other side. I can't tell if I'm hearing my own breathing or someone else's. I hate being so close to it, but I feel like I need to keep my weight on the door. Is this how I'm going to spend the rest of my life? No. There's another way out of here. I just realized. I could climb out of the windows into the hallway. The side of the building has enough architectural detail that I could make my way to the ground, if I'm careful. No good. I got my head up, but then I saw one of the windows below me open up. I could have climbed down easily, but I'd have to go right past that window and whatever was inside. The smell from the closet is leaking into the rest of the apartment. After being turned away at the window... I wanted to go back to the kitchen. When I got there, however, the door was open. The door was open. And the wire coat hanger from the living room? It was swinging from the doorknob. I had a clear view of the corridor outside, and there was nothing there. But was it waiting just out of view? Was it already in my apartment somewhere? I'm in the bathroom now. The door shut and locked. I don't know how much longer I can take all this. Maybe someone will notice when I don't show up for work tomorrow and come check on me. Maybe I can get out with them. I just heard footsteps. They came through the hall and stopped right outside the bathroom door. I think it's just standing there. It hasn't moved in minutes. It's scratching on the door. Scratching... There's a metallic ring to the sound like, like it's using the coat hanger. I can't stop thinking about the hook. Oh, please, no. The light's flickering. Don't go out, please. Don't go out, please. Can't see what I'm writing. It's too dark. It's still scratching, scratching, scratching. 
Why won't it stop? Please, someone help me. It started banging on the door now. I think I hear the wood cracking. Oh, please. No, 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 no. Just a tip for the close quarters of apartment living. It can be very important to introduce yourself to and get along with other tenants in your building. After all, friendly acquaintances are much less likely to hunt you down. And now, without delay, we will venture into another nightmare. As we turn a few more dusty pages further into James Colton's collection, we find an account from childhood. Retelling his experience, a man unfolds how his family occupied a new home wherein they found an undocumented room. It was such a strange, enigmatic little space that the young protagonist delighted in the thought of its exploration. Unfortunately, he had no idea why it worried his father so much. But soon, no explanation would be needed. Josh Irish performs James Colton's Doors. You'd never know it existed, looking at the house from the outside. Poking around inside would only cement your disbelief. But it's there. Somehow. Although the footprint of the house doesn't seem to allow for it, it's there. Tucked away in a feat of architectural genius. We first discovered it just before my baby brother was born. Dad got it into his head that we needed more space. He wanted to move his study, which occupied a small room at the end of the second floor hallway downstairs to make room for my baby brother's nursery. He was shocked to say the least, when instead of bursting into the sunlit side yard, the north wall of the living room fell away to reveal another room. The secret chamber, sealed up for who knows how long, was perfectly empty, save for a generous coating of dust. A closed door stood in the opposite wall, and it was lit by a single window. Everything from the ceiling to the hardwood floor was painted white. The discovery seemed to do a number on Dad's nerves. It was very much a man-is-king-of-his-castle sort of guy, and it bothered him deeply to not know every inch of his home. The window and door especially had him perturbed. The window, as best as we could figure, couldn't be seen from the outside. The door was the worst, however. It hinted at further unknown depths to the house that we'd never before suspected. As a young, excited little boy, it was only Dad's unease that held my exploratory urges in check. I remember him staring at that door, the gears of his mind almost audible as they churned through all the possible explanations. The construction work was put on hold as he tackled the mystery, darting in and out of the house, taking measurements and studying angles. At last, he finally let us in on his calculations. Well, I don't know. It adds up, sort of. Not really. That doesn't make any sense, commented Mom. Her brow furrowed as she tried to interpret his clueless conclusion. Dad seemed not to hear. He stepped cautiously into the white room and bent over the windowsill. Something's off, he grunted. I shouldn't be able to see the neighbor's garage from here. Mom made a vague suggestion about funny angles which Dad seemed to swallow for the time being as his eyes flew furtively toward the closed door in the far wall. Even the doorknob was white. How far does it go? I fell asleep that night with his questions cycling through my head. 
To find one hidden room was exciting enough, but the possibility that there were more. That door promised adventure, and it was an offer my boyish heart couldn't resist. I got up early the next morning and ran downstairs, eager to get a peek into the secret room before breakfast, before Dad's construction crew showed up to start working. Making straight for the closed door, I wrapped my fingers around the knob. It was made of wood, and paused. I remembered briefly seeing my dad's unease, but with the sunlight from the window warming my back, it seemed silly. The wooden ball turned easily in my grip, and with only the softest squeak, the door opened. I found myself in another room, nearly identical to the last one. Everything was white. There was another door directly opposite to the one I stood in, and a window warmed the entire scene, but this time from the other direction. Two secret rooms, and maybe even a third. My home had become a fairy tale castle in my mind, a pirate fortress of fantastical realm. Every boy dreamed of such places, filled with hidden passages just waiting to be explored. I was the lucky one whose dream came true. The second door opened, just as I'd guessed, on a third, then a fourth, a fifth. It didn't occur to me that it made no sense that, from the outside, I should have been well into the neighbor's yard by now. I only knew the thrill of discovery at this point. What would I find at the end? Treasures forgotten by the years? Waiting for my stubby little fingers to polish off the dust? It was in the sixth room that I had paused and glanced over my shoulder. I could see the distant living room, normal and boring, and I thought it looked very homey. A noise signaled the beginning of breakfast. The scent of eggs made its lazy way down the chain of empty rooms after me. Mom would call me back soon. Part of me was anxious to hear her voice. Why? The scent of adventure was strong in my nostrils. Stronger than the feeble aroma of eggs sizzling several worlds away. I gotta have eggs any time. Why should I abandon my expedition for something so mundane as breakfast? Yet, as I turned to face the next white door, my heart remained looking back to that familiar living room. Why this door? It looked exactly the same as the five that came before it. Why did it alone seem to dampen my adventurous spirit? Just one more, I thought. Then I'll go back. The seventh room was the same, but different. So very different. There was no window, no door from the far side. Instead, a rickety dresser leaned precariously against one wall, and a messily made bed occupied one corner. Every space in between was stuffed with either blankets or... And it was quite a shock to see... So many in all one place. Dolls. Some were plush, with button eyes and seams spilling guts of clouds. Others were made of harder stuff, ceramic with eyes of sparkling glass. The air in the last room was stuffy, likely because it was a dead end without even a window for ventilation. I admit, I was disappointed. I expected to find something more exciting than a few old pieces of furniture and chaotic collection of toys and laundry. Still, I took a moment to look around. Maybe in that dark slip between the bed and the floorboards, something was hidden. I was on my knees, crawling forward through the dust, when it happened. A distant bang, then another, louder, bang, 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 bang. Frightened, I spun around in time to see the last of the door slam shut, plunging me into darkness. You may be surprised to know I didn't scream. I think I was too shocked. After a moment of utter blindness, light from the previous room's window managed to work its way under the door. My eyes adjusted. I could see well enough. Well enough to regain my feet. Well enough to catch my tiny reflection in the doll's eyes well enough to notice something swelling on the bed. It was like something was inflating beneath the blankets, rising up through the dust-impregnated mattress. 
the wonder was gone. All thoughts of treasure and adventure evaporated as I scrambled back from the bed, fumbling for the doorknob as I watched the heavy sheets fall away from the materializing form. I clenched my eyes shut as the door opened, letting in the sunlight. I turned my back and ran, slamming the door shut again behind me. I didn't care what secrets that seventh chamber held anymore. I didn't care about anything except the numbers as I reopened the rooms and shut them up again. Counting down as I went. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. I screeched to a halt. I should have been back in my living room. My nose should have been full of the smell of scrambled eggs. I should have heard mom's voice calling me to the table. Instead, I faced another door. Just like the last. Maybe I, I counted wrong. The door opened. Another white room. And another after that. I stood panting in terror as I puzzled over my dilemma. Eight rooms behind me, I heard doors opening and closing, each sequence louder than the last. It's coming. With no other alternative, I opened the next door and kept running. The chain of chambers went on and on. I lost count, certain only that there were far more than there had been on my way in. They just went on and on without an end, each one exactly the same. My tiny legs grew tired, and finally, I stumbled and fell, scraping my knee against the rough wood floor. I began to whimper as I listened to my pursuer's progress, marked by the steady rhythm of creak, bangs, and creaks and bangs. I was trapped in an impossible labyrinth, hunted by something that had been waiting untold years for a curious little boy to come exploring. A sob escaped me as the bangs got closer. I couldn't run anymore. It was going to get me. The doorknob behind me rattled, began to turn, I spun my face to the agent of my doom. And as the door cracked open, I screamed the only thing I could think of, the only name that could bring comfort to a frightened child. I cried out for my mom at the top of my lungs. What is it? I turned back in the direction of my hopeless flight, back towards what I knew had been just another in the endless line of sinister doors which now was the rectangular hole Dad and his crew had knocked in the living room wall. Mom was standing there, her face riddled with concern. I burst into tears. Dad's project didn't make it very far. His crew ended up patching the hole, once more sealing away the seven or more than seven secret rooms. He and Mom agreed to just let the baby share their room until he got older. Then he'd move in with me. I told them what I'd seen, but I know they didn't believe me. I think the reason for the project's cancellation had more to do with Mom not wanting her living room trashed by the construction crew. Dad said she should have mentioned that before they started, but in the end, he caved. I hated the living room after that, and I always clung to the south wall whenever I had to pass through. But sometimes, late at night, while I tried to sleep, I thought I heard the sound of doors slamming. Rational people sometimes have to live with the unexplained. The best they can do to move past it is to try and put it out of mind as much as they can, and hope it never forces its way back into their lives again. After another brief message, James Colton will introduce us to a very distinctive dwelling. James Colton's Pages of Dust Buy it today on Amazon.com Kindle version free until November 25th Get Volume 1 Volume 2 and Volume 3 of James Colton's Pages of Dust
Now, it's time for this episode's main event. After the death of his parents, a man inherits his childhood home. As he returns to the domicile, he brings friends with him for company. However, even though this was where he grew up, he finds the place very forgettable. Supernaturally forgettable. As he reacquaints himself with his surroundings, there are some aspects that leave him feeling increasingly unnerved. Yours truly, that's me, your host, G.M. Danielson, performs the final of our stories from author James Colton's Pages of Dust. We present to you The Forgetful House. I stared up at the looming edifice in the crisp winter afternoon. I found it hard to believe that this was my house now, that after all these years I was returning as its master. The circumstances weren't at all what I'd wanted, but then again, what had I expected? There was no other way. My house, I muttered. How many times had I called it that as a child? Yet now, to actually utter the words felt wrong. They held a new meaning, a meaning that didn't seem at all right. There was a loud clatter as Mike slid open the door of the moving van. Let's get started, he said. Go ahead and start unloading, I replied to Mike and my two other friends. Eric and Ryan. I'm going to go through and get all the doors open. I fished a heavy set of keys from my pocket. One for every room. I knew from my parents' in-house nurse that most of the doors inside were locked. It kept them from getting too lost, she said. The entryway smelled strongly of dust, and beneath that was a subtle odor that I recognized immediately. Every house has a peculiar scent, one you can detect on any of its residents, and that defines the family. This was my smell, my family's smell. It smelled like home. Leaving the front door open for my friends as they began carting in the furniture, I strode down the hallway pausing at each door as I searched for the right key to open it. Once I was done with the first floor, I headed upstairs. There were five bedrooms up there, and a bathroom. Once more, I worked my way down, unlocking doors, until I came to the last room on the right, the master bedroom. I got as far as putting the key to the lock when I paused. This was where it had happened. I slowly withdrew my hand. There was no reason to go in there. No reason to disturb that room. Returning downstairs, I was met with a surprise. Several boxes were stacked in the hallway, and all three of my friends had shed their coats and were brushing large clumps of snow from their limbs. That blizzard came out of nowhere, said Ryan. I glanced out the window. Indeed, I couldn't see across the street. The snow was falling so heavily. The weatherman didn't call for a storm, I said. Well, you know how reliable they are, answered Eric. There's no point in working in that. So we figured we'd just crash here for a while and wait it out. So that's exactly what we did. We unpacked the few boxes that had made it inside and rearranged some of the already existing furniture. But the storm showed no signs of waning. I guess that's what you get for moving so close to the Great Lakes, said Ryan as we stared out the windows. I hope your microwave made it inside. It had, and so we prepared a quick dinner, which we ate in the living room. 
I stared at the roaring blaze in the fireplace. It got dark outside quickly, owing to the short days of winter and the raging blizzard, and before long, our little corner of the house was the only one still blessed with light. Everywhere else had fallen into hushed and dusty silence. We laughed heartily, letting the echoes of our mirth fill the chamber in defiance of winter's fury. What could the storm do to us in here? We had warmth and light, and our good humor ignited our spirits as it reverberated off the walls, bouncing from ceiling to floor, corner to corner, until the entire room seemed alive with cheerful idiots. It was more than a cozy chamber could contain. Our laughter spilled out into the empty corridors, where it struggled with the darkness, failed, and died miserably away, just like Mother. Hey, bellowed Eric, the remnants of a joke still showing at the corners of his eyes. What's come over you? I recovered myself. Sorry, I apologized. Say, the other week... The mood was restored as I launched into a comical tale invented on the spot. Our laughter resumed, and I followed it as it soared over my head and out the door to my back, out once more into those darkened hallways where nothing but shadows moved. I listened to it as it stirred the dust in its last feeble death throes, watched as the shapes, satisfied that their murderous work was done, retreated to their quiet posts. Are you sure you're all right? asked Ryan. <laughs> my imagination, I replied, shaking my head as I turned back to face my friends. <sighs> Perhaps I should get myself to bed. Eric spared a glance at the dusty grandfather clock that rested in the corner. If that thing still worked, he said, then I dare say we should all follow your lead. It's worse than that, I'm afraid, said Mike, looking up from his watch. I suggest we call it a night before we all start having hallucinations. Who knows what the midnight hour could do to our fragile minds? Everyone chuckled at his remark. Except me. Familiarity breeds fear. Paradoxical, I know. Perhaps you can't realize when things are wrong unless you are intimately aware of how things should be. As I walked the corridors on my way to bed, I was aware. I had, after all, grown up in this house. I knew all its nooks and crannies. I knew how shadows fell across the floor and climbed up the walls. I knew the lumpy mass hovering to my right was just my father's coat hanging on a doorknob except that father was dead, and there was no door. But why shouldn't there have been a door there? I pondered the question as I passed, refusing to give the lumpy shape a second glance. Yes, there should have been. Once everything was settled down, I'd have one installed. Who cared if it opened into nothing? At least then, there'd be a reason for father's coat to hang there, on a doorknob that did not exist. I reached my room, shut the door, and locked it, then wondered what should happen if I had to get out in the middle of the night. I reminded myself that it already was the middle of the night, and my other worry. What if something tried to get in, kept me from unlocking it? But what should want to get in? I tried not to think about it as I changed into my pajamas and climbed into bed. It was my house, except it wasn't. It was my parents' house. I settled down under the covers, sinking into the silence of my parents' house. Elsewhere, my friends were quickly falling asleep, unfamiliar, unaware. They couldn't possibly realize that the tree which they'd all admired for its aged charm earlier in the day was just a couple feet too far to the left, for it cast that particular shadow, the one that looked like a hand, upon the wall. Best get moving quickly, 
announced Mike as we emerged from the house. The radio says last night's storm was just the beginning. We're about to get walloped. I really couldn't have chosen a worse time to move, but there was nothing to be done about it now. We hastily cleared a path through the foot of snow and began carting boxes and furniture inside. We had a few moments of brilliant sunshine, sparkling off the whitewashed ground like diamonds, before the clouds rolled in again. The snowflakes began to tumble lazily from the sky, and when the lake effect began to fall in earnest, we closed up the van and called it a day. We'll be at this all week if it keeps up, huffed Ryan, stomping his boots in the entryway. I hope you're not in a hurry to get rid of us. I was in no hurry. In fact, I loathed the moment when I'd have to enter the house by myself to sit and walk and sleep in its emptiness. No one to talk to or laugh with. I might have gone even so far as to say I was afraid. Not out loud, of course. We spent the rest of the afternoon shoving boxes into their proper rooms, sorting through my parents' old possessions to decide what to keep and what to throw out. I felt horribly guilty every time I placed an item in the garbage pile, convinced that it must have held some sentimental value. I wondered if mother and father would disapprove of my ruthless sorting. I wondered if they'd even recognize most of the heirlooms. Above the constant din of our work, the radio crackled, struggling for clear reception as the storm mucked up the signal. The weathermen prophesied a bleak forecast. At least another two feet of snow by tonight, as much as three come tomorrow morning. I wondered if my friends would ever be able to leave. They apparently shared similar sentiments. Well, said Eric, stretching his sore arms, I've about had enough for today. No rush, right? Since we're stuck here until spring. We all voiced our agreement with weak laughs, and fetching some microwave dinners from the kitchen, retired to the living room. The fire crackled merrily as we ate, and afterward we fell to talking, just as we had the previous night. The storm this time was fiercer, though, and its moans shook the house as we tried to find a way inside. The cheering effects of the warm fireplace and our full bellies were dampened beneath the ferocity of the blizzard. Our jokes were few and far between, and our conversation slid ever closer to dark subjects. At last, Eric sighed. What a storm. Nights like this are really only good for one thing. He cast his gaze about the room, eyeing each of us in turn with a meaningful expression. The telling of ghost stories. Maybe it was just the way he said it. Maybe the winter gale had finally found a chink in the house's armor. Maybe it was something else. We all shivered at his suggestion. Or was it just me? Come now, he chided us with a sneer. We're all men. Show some nerve. Or do you actually believe in ghosts? Did I believe in ghosts? Whether I did or not was irrelevant. If they did exist, then the only ones I had to worry about in this house, in my house, were mother and father. Why should I be afraid of them? Well then, Eric continued, since you're all so spineless, I'll go first. He launched into his tale quietly, whispering so we had to lean forward in our chairs to listen. It turned out Eric was a masterful storyteller. As he expounded on the details of his fictional specter, made all too real by the groaning of the wind, I realized I'd chosen the seat with its back to the door and the cold darkness behind. I was terribly aware of that empty space, that gasping space, and the air seemed to cringe behind me. Eric was reaching the climax of his story. His voice was more hushed than ever. Mike and Ryan were eating it up, 
but I could barely hear. I strained to make out the words, but the harder I tried, the more impossible it seemed. I felt cut off from my friends, pushed farther away into the lonely dark with each passing second, until I thought for sure they'd pass out of sight and hearing forever. Better stop, Eric, Ryan said teasingly. Our host looks like he's about to faint. The shadows relinquished their hold, retreating into their proper corners, and I was amongst my friends again. My parents died in this house, you know. My friends exchanged nervous glances. Yes, replied Mike. You told us uh, at the funeral. It happened in the master bedroom. I went on as if I hadn't said anything. That's the room next to yours, Mike. Then I realized everyone was staring at me. Confused. Scared. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why I... Quite all right, assured Mike. But I, I may demand that we may trade rooms. You're probably just tired, said Eric. We all are. I'm sure with all this heavy lifting and in such bad weather, too. We could all use some extra rest, Ryan agreed. Maybe we should turn in early tonight. So we did. My three friends followed me upstairs, three sets of footsteps echoing my own. The first disappeared as we passed Ryan's room. He said goodnight and was gone. The second vanished shortly after. Then the third. The fourth persisted, and I steadfastly ignored it. I was careful as I entered my bedroom and shut the door, not to turn, for in turning I might see, and in seeing, I might lose my already tenuous grasp on reason. I changed quickly and dove between the blankets, not giving myself time to wonder if I'd made the bed that morning or if the sheets had been mussed up like that all day. I lay there, far from restful, my eyes darting here and there, as I tried to keep them from resting on any one spot long enough to notice what was wrong. Deep down, I hoped one of my friends had noticed something. Maybe Mike, who slept next door to my parents' bedroom, was frightened enough by my outburst in the living room to seek companionship. The hope died within me. We were all grown men. Pride would never allow us such an admission of weakness. Indeed, that was what prevented me from venturing out in search of comfort. I was ashamed of myself. There I was, cowering like a child in my own house, my parents' house, I reminded myself. It had never been mine, not since I moved out to start college. No, I was a stranger now. I had no more right to call the place mine than Eric or Mike or Ryan. A stranger in my parents' house. I finally tried closing my eyes, and that helped. Blind, I couldn't notice the wayward shadows. I couldn't acknowledge the drifting shapes. I could only listen. Listening, I could only be aware of the howling wind, the groaning house, the knocking pipes. Then there was a high-pitched whine, a click. I opened my eyes and by the sudden absence of my alarm clock's gentle glow, I knew the power was out. I crawled reluctantly out of bed. Without power, there was no heat. Without heat, we'd all be frozen to death by morning. I remembered that my father had a generator put in the basement when I was a child, so with a shiver I began the long trek through the house. Familiarity breeds fear. You can always tell when you pass by something that isn't there, or fail to pass by something that is. It's the emptiness you feel pulling at your shoulder, or the small of your back, the presence that pushes against you, begging to be acknowledged. In the darkness, unless you're familiar with your surroundings, you can't be aware of these things. If you know, then you can't ignore them. With my friends all accounted for, 
sleeping in their unfamiliar beds. The hallways were empty. I felt compelled down the expanse as a howling filled my ears. The sucking, hollow, rasping breath of my parents' house. Of course, it was just the wind and the heat, unsustained electricity being drained out by the winter storm. Of course it was. About a quarter of the way down, resting on one of the steps was a dark, amorphous shape. It might have been just a shadow, but what could have cast it? I had to make a choice, and I decided that if I moved, I'd return to bed, pile on some extra blankets, and deal with the cold until morning. I waited. The shape didn't move. Just a shadow after all. Every step had one, and every step cast its own dark silhouette on the one below. Still, when I reached that step, I skipped over it. What I saw on the first floor, illuminated by the feeble brightness of the blowing snow, was desolate, foreign. It made me think of my parents and of their decayed minds right before the end. I hurried through, holding my breath lest I inhale some remnant of their disease that clung to the walls, oozed across the floor, or dripped from the ceiling. Some scrap of delirium manifested in the creeping forms that any other man, less familiar with the angles and physics of the house, would have dismissed as the trick of the light. I reached the basement door and marched down the steps, feeling those tiny gaps between the stair treads grasping at my heels. It was utterly black down there, and I had to rely on memory to find where the generator rested. After a few minutes of stumbling around blindly, I stubbed my toe against it. Kneeling down, I ran my fingers along its cool surface, fumbling as I tried to get the machine going. As the light flickered on, there was a fleeting impression at the edge of my vision, a fluttering of panicked energy. I turned my attention toward the source and beheld the dimly lit basement, cluttered with forgotten bundles and boxes. Some of the debris I recognized from my childhood. Others were unfamiliar. I tried to track down where the flurry of motion had hid itself. Was it behind that crate? Under that blanket? I realized I was being foolish. What would I do if I found what I was looking for? break my neck as I scrambled up the uneven steps, screaming like a little girl. I turned my back on the basement and flipped the light switch off. I was better off not seeing. I thundered back upstairs, back through the shifting corridors, past the shapes I told myself weren't really there. My hand fumbled on the doorknob to my bedroom. Of course, I had shut the door, right? I must have, because it was closed, and there was, I insisted, nothing else that could have shut it. Finally, I stumbled inside, none too gracefully as I tripped over a pile of clothes that I knew shouldn't have been there. What are you doing? asked Eric as he propped himself up sleepily. Wrong room, I apologized, backing out slowly and shutting the door. Lost in my own house. I couldn't help but recall how all the doors had been locked when we first arrived to keep them from getting lost. Now it was happening to me. That's why I was noticing things. Nothing was different. Nothing was wrong at all. It was me. I counted the rooms carefully this time as I proceeded all the way down to the end of the hall making sure I chose the door on the left, the one that stood open. Had I closed it? I couldn't remember anymore, and with a chilling sense of doom, I realized I was turning into them. I lay down in my bed, 
and I realized I was shaking. I tried to ignore the noises, the shadows, all the aberrations that my familiarity with the house allowed me to detect. They were not aberrations. I was the aberration, just like they had been to each other. I wondered if I'd recognize my friends when I woke up. The storm, blessedly, had stopped by the time the sun rose, and my three friends, whom I recognized with an overwhelming sense of relief, helped me finish unloading the moving van. Looks like that's it, said Ryan as he slid the door shut. Thanks for all your help, guys, I said. Sorry things got dragged out like that. Mike shrugged off the apology. Can't control the weather. At least the roads are clear. Snowplows had been buzzing back and forth while we worked, allaying our fears of being stranded. The electricity had been restored, and everything seemed cheerful in spite of my harrowing night. Listen, said Eric. Since we won't be seeing as much of each other anymore, what do you say to grabbing lunch somewhere and before we head out. I agreed, and we piled into my car and drove down the street to a small diner, where we talked and joked and laughed one last time together. It was unbelievably pleasant, getting out of my parents' house for once. It had been three days, but already I had grown weary of the empty hallways and dusty chambers and that locked bedroom door on the second floor. It would be that much more desolate once my friends were gone. I'd be alone, utterly unknown in that expansive house so full of shadows and so terribly familiar. I began to wonder why I had agreed to take the house. Why, after all my siblings had stated their lack of interest in the place, had I foolishly decided to move in? I was cutting myself off from my friends, trading their cheerful conversation for a constant reminder of my parents' pitiful end. It was my mother. You know how bad their Alzheimer's disease was. But it was my mother who started it. She didn't recognize my father got startled and knocked his head against the mirror. The strain was too much for them both, and they died like that, tearing at each other, each convinced in their own mind that they were fighting off an intruder. They never liked strangers coming into their house. I realized with some embarrassment that my friends were all staring at me from across the table, their burgers hovering awkwardly between their gaping mouths. Their eyes were full of concern and bewilderment. No, said Eric. I'm not sure you know how to have a good time. You're looking kind of pale, Ryan chimed in. Are you sure you're all right? Sorry, I sighed. Just pretend I, I didn't say that. Memories, you know. They all nodded slowly, their eyes betraying a lack of understanding. We finished our lunch in relative silence before driving back to the house. We said our goodbyes. Then my friends climbed into the moving van and left me alone. Alone. I turned back to my parents' house, and alone, I crossed the familiar threshold, shutting the front door quietly behind me and locking it. I gazed about me, studying the piles of boxes yet to be unpacked. One of them was half open, throwing a flimsy cardboard flap into the air to reveal its crowded contents. I stared sickly at it in the knowledge that we hadn't opened any boxes that morning. They were all taped shut. I had taped them shut, right? I thought about going over and closing up that rebellious box. But then, whether by a draft or something else, the loose panel quivered. It was a slight movement that I may have imagined, but all the same, I turned my back on it and climbed upstairs. The second floor hallway gaped at me, its windowless expanse clouded with murky shadows 
punctuated by pale shafts of light from the other bedrooms. At least the ones whose doors were open. At the far end on the right, there was nothing to dispel the darkness. As I approached the heart of the gloom, the corridor marked my progress. A door hinge creaked to my left. A sighing draught hissed past my ear. The floor squeaked beneath my feet. I was being watched. Prodded. I felt unwelcome, a stranger in my parents' house. I reached the end of the hall and fished the ring of keys from my pocket. As long as that door remained shut, I'd have no peace. If it was allowed to keep its secrets, then they'd haunt me forever. The only way to break the spell, I thought, was to open that door and release whatever lay coiled inside it. The lock clicked. The knob turned. The hinges reluctantly moved. Had I been expecting something? A rush of wind. A sound of panic discovery. There was nothing. It was all as I remembered. The king-sized bed was unmade. The sheets were tangled unceremoniously atop the mattress. The dresser was covered with dust and tiny sparkling shards, pieces of the shattered mirror above. Toward this item I was drawn. I examined my reflection in the jagged remains of the mirror, observed the emptiness of the bedroom behind me. Then, compelled by a cold, invisible force, my face cracked against the broken glass. Telling the young that they should leave their parents' home while spreading their wings into adulthood is sage advice. More good advice may be to avoid returning to that empty nest, for if they do, they could find it hard to look at the reflection staring back at them from the mirror. Now stand by for a final message before we share exciting upcoming news from the world of The Simply Scary Podcast. Daylightdooms.com Uh? Uh, I thought I heard something. Daylightdooms.com Man, the voices are a little louder than usual today. Go to Daylightdooms.com uh, Go to Daylightdooms.com Yes. Do I have to draw you a map? Ha uh, ha. Uh, can I help you with some? Yes. You can go to DaylightDims.com to get the Daylight Dim Story Collection Volume 2. Or you can get it on Amazon.com. Wait a minute, is this a commercial? Who is this? Oh, come on, guy. I get commission off this. Fine. Jeez, I'll go to DaylightDims.com and get the Daylight Dim Story Collection Volume 2. Is there anything else? Uh, yeah. Do you validate parking? Good grief. If you enjoyed this sample of the work of James Colton, we're pleased to announce that his Pages of Dust collection isn't just an ebook, it's a series of ebooks. Just visit simplyscarypodcast.com, click Episodes in the navigation bar, then Section 1, and find the posting for this episode, Episode 10. There, you'll find links to Volumes 1 through 3 of the Pages of Dust story collection. When sampling the books and enjoying them, please leave a review saying that Simply Scary sent you. 
by following the links from our website and then completing your purchase, Amazon will thank the Simply Scary podcast for the business by providing us a percentage of their portion of the sale. And author James Colton gets 100% of his portion of the proceeds as well. It's a win-win and a very easy way to help support our program and a new horror author. Now, if you're a horror author like James Colton that would like to have your work adapted to a professional level, reasonably priced audio book to help you terrify new audiences on sites such as audible.com, reach out to us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and we will set up a free consultation on how we can best bring your stories to life. If you think your work has what it takes to be featured on the Simply Scary Podcast, visit simplyscarypodcast.com forward slash submit a story and let us see if it has what it takes to be simply scary. To support the production of more high-quality audio experiences and receive hundreds of audio stories in the highest format we can possibly offer you, Visit ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com forward slash tour and become a patron today. You can be the catalyst for our calamity, and with your support, we can bring more sleepless nights and unsettling days into your future. Stay alert in the coming month to get the latest updates on our newest project, where we will move to bring our stories to life in breathtaking animation. Artist David Romero, creator of our popular thumbnail images for the Simply Scary podcast and the Simply Scary speed painting series on YouTube, will be creating stunning animated visuals for our series and more, beginning with a production featuring fan favorite, 15 plus million subscriber YouTube content creator and let's play gamer, Markiplier, Mark Fishbark. Hit the subscribe button below to be instantly alerted as soon as updates are presented regarding this exciting development. Subscribing is the best way to stay on top of the news to come. We will be presenting examples of what we have in mind, along with other details leading up to the Kickstarter campaign, where you can not only make this a reality, but you will have the opportunity to walk away with top of the line rewards, including some that are interactive, in exchange for your support. So subscribe today and stay tuned to the Simply Scary Podcast on YouTube and iTunes. Finally, it is time for one of my favorite features of our show, reading one of the many helpful reviews on iTunes. For this episode, our winner is Lightblade91. Lightblade91 writes, The stories and the voice actors make these tales, well, simply scary. Love it. (laughs) Thank you for leaving that comment and review on iTunes, Lightblade91. We'll need you to take a screenshot of your iTunes account page and your username and review and email it to contact at simplyscarypodcast.com for your special gift from us here at the Simply Scary Podcast. To all our other listeners out there who are just waiting for my supple tones to recite their review, just make sure to subscribe and comment to us on iTunes and you could be mentioned just like Lightblade91 on our show. This is GM Danielson thanking you for joining us for this episode. Remember, listeners, the pages of that book that contains the story of your life will eventually become dusty too, and the ending may be coming sooner than you think. But we will see you next time when we show you there is nothing simple about being scared. Unless, of course, it is the Simply Scary Podcast. This is executive producer Jesse Cornett. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out more from these authors at simplyscarypodcast.com. There you can find all information regarding the show and the stories appearing here in our podcast. 
The Simply Scary Podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment. The showcase is written by Jesse Cornett and Dustin Kosky and produced by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary Podcast is GM Danielson. Original music during the show by Jesse Cornett. This broadcast was directed and created by Craig Groshek. Be sure to look for the Simply Scary Podcast on iTunes. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star review. Comments or questions, email us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and check our website for more information. While you're there, consider clicking on the patrons link at the top of the page to help support our show. Copyright Chilling Entertainment LLC 2016. Thanks for listening. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.